My people, my people, we're ready to mount up like a eagle. Stand and fight against evil. A system rigged and deceitful. Welcome to the King Talk Podcast, where we're all about truth, community, and discussing the things you care about because we care about you. Of course, I'm your host, Adam Coleman. Our guest has put more than his fair share of work in for the African-American community, from the local all the way up to the national level. Our guest is a graduate of University of Pennsylvania, as well as Union Theological Seminary in New York and Princeton Theological Seminary. Uh, He's the immediate past senior minister of Nazarene Congregational United Church of Christ. Previously dubbed the hip-hop minister, he's had an interesting set of experiences, which I hope we can get into here in a moment, including working with Jesse Jackson's campaign efforts and working closely with Louis Farrakhan as well. So I'm glad y'all are locked in for this episode. It's just a powerful story about a man's journey, community activism, and what it means to be a Christian and impacting the world with truth and compassion. My people, my people, we're ready to mount up like a eagle. Stand and fight against evil. A system rigged and deceitful. King, you can hear it when I rhyme, I'm a king. Renewed in my mind, I'm a king. I got a different bloodline, I'm a king. Jump, jump, I am a king, I'm a king. I am honored to have with us today, Reverend Conrad Tilliard. How you doing there, brother? I'm I'm doing great, my friend. How are you? Doing wonderful, doing wonderful. Well, we thank you for coming on the show, man. There's, there's so much um, in your story that I want to get to. It's, it's uh, fascinating. And so uh, I want to start with this here. You know, many people know that Reverend Conrad Tillard was once Minister Conrad Muhammad of the Nation of Islam. Now, what they may not know is that uh, not only were you a, a Nation of Islam minister, but you were on a short list of heir parents uh, to Louis Farrakhan, a list that probably included only you and the late Khalid Muhammad. Um, you also led Harlem's fame mosque number seven, where Malcolm X once resided and gained quite a national reputation for your work uh, with the NOI. So uh, tell us about your spiritual journey. What led you into the Nation of Islam and what led you out of it and into Christianity? Well, it's a, that's an excellent question, uh, and I agree with you. Uh, if I do say so myself, it's a fascinating journey, and it's even fascinating to me, and I've lived it. So I can imagine people wonder, how does someone go from being uh, a minister in the nation, Minister Conrad Muhammad, well-known, popular, uh, all over the nation, uh, doing great work, uh, and then... Next thing, sometimes people say, next thing I heard is, you've got a new name, Reverend Conrad Tillard. And the truth of the matter is, I was not born in Afghanistan or Pakistan. I was born right here in the United States. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I grew up uh, in a prototypical African-American family. Uh, We were rooted in the church. Um, and, And that's even a fascinating story I'll get more into detail in the book, but let's let suffice to say I grew up in a very strong Christian family, um, in many ways uh, matrifocal, uh, and yet at the same time, at least the religious part was probably more matrifocal, uh, but I grew up with very strong male role models uh, as well uh, in my family, but religiously, it, it pretty much starts with my grandmother. Uh, my maternal grandmother, and, you know, we were rooted and reared in the love and fear of the Lord Christ. And, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, but I I will say that I was probably a Christian culturally, or or I was a Christian culturally, uh, Mm -hmm. because in my family, that's all you could be. That's all I I knew of. I did happen to grow up at a time when, uh, you know, the most popular figure in the world, uh, was a man named Muhammad Ali. So I was always aware of the nation uh, because I was an athlete. Uh, Ali was such an iconic figure. Uh, we all uh, had an appreciation in the 60s and 70s uh, for uh, the nation of Islam, but it was it was really a, a foreign uh, face to me. It was a foreign concept, but you couldn't deny you knew of Malcolm X. And, of course, Ali, again, was so mainstream. He was in your homes. He was in 
but you would hear him talk about uh, he wanted to thank his leader and teacher, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and you would see the brothers around him. And I think it's very important for people to understand that my journey is pretty typical of most young African-American males growing up in the inner city environment. Uh, there were many things that were important to me. Uh, being involved in church was not the most. Uh, and yet, and yet, uh, I knew of, of the Lord. Now, uh, fast forward a bit, as you get older and you get to, uh, college, um, and this was very pivotal for me. Uh, I, you know, began to explore and I began to, uh, gain and acquire more knowledge. Well, for me, the first awakening uh, politically, uh, socially, and spiritually was not walking down the aisle in someone's church and accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Uh, ironically, my interest in ministry began in 1984 when Reverend Jesse L. Jackson ran for president. Uh, it was pivotal time for me, a freshman in college. Uh, I got very active, very involved in that campaign. Uh, and as a young person, African-American, observing Reverend Jesse Jackson, my mind was blown wide open. He was a tall, articulate, very proud man. And of course, I knew of Reverend Jackson growing up in the 70s and 80s. And he was always omnipresent. He taught us wonderful things like, uh, uh, you know, I am somebody. I remember the I am somebody, uh, the, the black power, the black litany. Mm -hmm. um, and that in, impacted me. But when he ran for president in 1984, to, to hear him articulate his, his vision of the Rainbow Coalition, him uh, essentially talk about the, the beloved community, uh, it made me more sensitive to those things. Uh, and at a certain point in that campaign, as I watched him unite black, brown, red, yellow, white, as I watched him uh, pull together a coalition of urban uh, gang leaders and uh, Muslims, Nation of Islam Muslims and white farmers from Vermont, it, 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 it really uh, 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 inspired me. Uh, and it wasn't uh, very difficult for me to to begin to look at ministry, uh, not as just priestly functions or pastoral ministry, uh, which is what I pretty much had been exposed to, uh, with the exception of my, my stepfather, who was in the civil rights movement. Uh, and yes, I did get a chance to spend a lot of time around civil rights ministers, but this was different. I was, you know, a young person now, uh, and I was, this was my time. And uh, I began to really begin to see the importance of a ministry rooted in the social gospel, a minister that was just as conversant uh, in the sacred scriptures, the epistles, uh, but also, uh, 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 you know, conversant about the whole conversation of justice, whole conversation about uh, the locked out, the left out, the despised and rejected. And Reverend Jackson so brilliantly and articulately uh, talked about that in that first campaign mm -hmm. uh, that I was turned on. I was turned on. I still didn't uh, want to be a minister. Uh, my, my goal uh, was to be a professional. That's why I was in college. Uh, but I was inspired. Right, right. Interesting. So, so, so how did you get from there to actually, you know, going all in and following Farrakhan's teachings and really getting into joining the, uh, the Nation of Islam? Ironically, during that time, the most significant other voice uh, that I heard in the campaign was that of Minister Louis Farrakhan. Uh, he was someone that I did not know much about, uh, and, 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 but yet his voice was so powerful uh, in the campaign but initially, uh, I thought it was a very negative voice, uh, and I w wished that he would just stop it, stop talking, because I felt 
that he was derailing the campaign of, of Reverend Jackson. Uh, to make a long story short, uh, the, the campaign ran its course. Uh, as a young person involved in the political process, I was disillusioned, disheartened by how the Democrats treated Reverend Jackson. And ironically, it would be almost uh, 30 years later, 20 some odd years later, when another tall uh, African American would come out of Chicago and he would ultimately he would ultimately be the fulfillment of what Reverend Jackson had talked about and what he uh, uh, tried to accomplish in 1984. But in 84, America wasn't ready for it. It was, mm -hmm. in my view, America had not grown to the point where it could see an African American uh, uh, being a leader, a uh, mainstream leader leading the country. Many things would change that uh, in those 30 years. I think hip hop changed that a lot. Uh, because it helped to bring about the Obama coalition of young whites that had grown up knowing blacks as business executives and business people that they looked up to. It's a whole other story. But the point uh, uh, that, that was really significant is that I was, I was on a journey. Mm -hmm. And while it didn't start out as a religious journey, I think it's quite uh, providential that the two men that inspired me most in what I thought was a social uh, uh, a concern, social movement, were, were ministers, um, one Christian, one Muslim. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I, I went to hear Minister Louis Farrakhan speak in Washington, D.C. in 1984. And I said, you know, you can't, you know, I, I, was, I was lost. I mean, the campaign was over. Um, Reverend Jackson was not elected president. Uh, the racism uh, that I witnessed, uh, the rejection of him um, made me uh, seek. And, and so I said, well, let me go hear Farrakhan. Let me give him a chance. Let me listen to what he's saying. Uh, and I went with an open mind, a somewhat skeptical mind, but uh, I went to hear him. And he talked about the campaign. He talked about how white America had a tendency of rejecting black leaders that did not follow the script. And he went down this long litany of, of black ministers and black activists, Martin King, Malcolm X, Paul Robeson, the Black Panther Party, all these people who had been rejected by white America. And then he said, we rejected them because white America rejected them. And, and, and I was sold, and I began to purchase more and more tapes and, and, and listen. I still hadn't joined the nation, but I was deeply inspired. And, you know, I, I listened, I listened, and then one day uh, on a vacation home for Thanksgiving, a very good friend of mine who was still in high school at the time was going to the mosque, and uh, I was at his um, uh, mom's house, and that Sunday, uh, the, after Thanksgiving, right before I went back to college, I went to the mosque, which uh, this particular mosque was in Washington, D.C., at Howard University uh, Hotel. And as though we were going off to war, she gave us breakfast and told her we were going to join the nation. And it was there. We went to the service and we were inspired. And it was such an austere and yet impressive environment. Uh, the minister in the mosque was um, a medical doctor, a physician, a surgeon, uh, a mental giant. And, and he was a minister, and he blew me away. And before I know it, uh, when he asked, who wants to join, uh, who believes what they heard today is true, and wants to uh, give their life to the work of uplifting the black man and woman of America. And I raised my hand, came down the aisle. And uh, that was the beginning of that process. And right, right. So, you know, now once you joined the Nation of Islam, it seemed like, I mean, you just went whole hog, man. <laughs> you got busy uh, pretty fast. So, you know, tell us a little bit about that, you know, uh, in terms of your experiences uh, in the Nation of Islam and the type of work that you were doing. You know, just to give you some bullet points, obviously, sure. um, people know I came to New York City uh, after being an activist. Uh, I've been a youth minister, student activist, and eventually I became the national youth minister for the nation. And then 
I was appointed to uh, the historic Moss Number no. 7 in Harlem. And that was a blessing because it happened in the golden age of hip-hop. It happened when, 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 when hip-hop was the dominant influence among, among young people. And my charge was to come here and preach the gospel of Elijah Muhammad and try to get people to join the nation. And I did get many people to join, and people who were coming from the church and some people who were coming from nowhere. And I preached, uh, I, I hatched, I hitched, and I ditched, <laughs> meaning I blessed babies, uh, I, 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 I married couples, I counseled rappers and and gang bangers and young people, and I did tragic funerals, but mostly tried to work in the community, inspiring people uh, with that message that they could clean their lives up, they could become better people. And of course, you know, this was during the crack era mm -hmm. of New York, so it was a very difficult time in Harlem uh, and throughout the nation. And yet, I was in South Central Los Angeles, in uh, Detroit, uh, in uh, Atlanta, all over the nation doing this great work and uh, look like that would, would be my life. I mean, you know, I completely and totally uh, believed and expected that uh, my ministry uh, in totality would be there in, in the nation of Islam. Mm -hmm. Well, in about around 1997, uh, that that changed um, after a series of um, great successes, you know, and really, and that's why I know God had to be at the root of this. So I was, you know, by all measurements, I was at the peak of my career and success, peak of effectiveness, known all over the nation, one of the most prominent spokespersons in the nation, uh, had relationships with the rappers and uh, the pastors and the community people, elected officials. Tupac had just been killed, and we'd done significant amount of work bring, trying to bring folks together yeah. before yeah. that, after that. Uh, uh, and, and, and in 1997, uh, the powers that be and decisions beyond my control uh, uh, set in motion a set of circumstances where Ben, ben Chavis, who was uh, a United Church of Christ minister, ironically, would uh, become the minister of Moss Number no. 7. Uh, and so at 32 years old, at the height of my career, I had to make a, a decision. What, what would I do with my life? And I was asked to come to Chicago uh, and to continue my ministry in the nation of Islam there. Uh, but the Lord spoke to me, and it wasn't a very clear message, uh, but the Lord put it in my heart to go to seminary. Now, I can't tell you why. I, I don't understand why, because I was, I, I, I was a Muslim. I, I didn't have any intentions of returning to the church. Um, in fact, I looked at some of the seminary programs, and Union Theological Seminary was right in New York, an excellent seminary, and Yale was right in New Haven. But for some reason, I decided I wanted to go to Harvard because Harvard's program, they had a focus uh, and a concentration on world religion. And so that's where I wanted to be. Um, I was a Muslim, and you know, I could learn about world religions. I could do work in that area. Mm -hmm. And I felt that would be a good place for me to recuperate, to regroup. I was a little tired, I guess, and needed to be debriefed. And uh, it had been a lot of action uh, from 1985 to 1997. Uh, so much that obviously we don't have time to go into it, but I'd been moving on a, on a, on a merry-go-round that was moving hundred miles an hour and I needed time to figure out the next move and the Lord put it in, in, in my heart to be on a seminary campus. In fact, I had a great dilemma. I was accepted to Howard Law School and uh, Harvard Divinity School and I was at a crossroads, uh, but I decided to go on to the 
Divinity School, and it was there in Divinity School. Mm. I began to, uh, you know, enjoy the classes and uh, begin to really delve into some of the uh, uh, coursework, and and I enjoyed it. You know, I was I was I was really having a good time academically. And then a professor came from Morehouse College, a man named Walter Fluker, and he taught uh, a series of courses on how to learn. And I took those courses. I didn't know who Howard Thurman was. I'd heard his name associated with Morehouse College, but I, I can tell you I was blown away by uh, Thurman. I was blown away uh, by this enlightened Baptist minister from Jacksonville, Florida, but had a world view. And I might add, one of the issues in growing up is that I grew up in uh, among people who were largely fundamentalist, fundamentalist Christian. Uh, and so, uh, you know, to hear of the story of of Howard Thurman going to sit with Gandhi, and engaging in that interfaith dialogue, and uh, his broad view uh, was appealing to my intellect. Mm -hmm. uh, I hadn't, I had not, I hadn't lived long enough. Uh, you know, one of the things about Christian theology is that when you grow up culturally a Christian. You know you're a Christian. Your family's Christian. You go to church, but you got to live a little bit. I'm I'm convinced. You got to get out in the world and do some things. You got to mess some things up, and you got to fall down a bit to understand the value of grace. I used to hear about grace, uh, grace, 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 but I didn't understand grace. Mm -hmm. But as I began to study Thurman, and as I began to look at Christian theology, um, and as I began to move unknowingly closer and closer to the Lord Jesus Christ, I came back to New York uh, on a break from Harvard. My pastor now, uh, though he wasn't then, he was my friend and colleague in the ministry, uh, Reverend Dr. Calvin Butts, he asked me, um, how much of your involvement in the nation of Islam is, is, or as a Muslim, is central to your work among youth? And I thought that was a rather strange question because mm -hmm. I hadn't thought about that much. Um, and then he went on to say, you know, I wish you would come back to the church. And if you came to Abyssinian, he talked about he wanted me to become a youth pastor there. And he would help me to go to seminary, and he was a very generous uh, author. But I said to him, oh, well, Doc, I said, I haven't had that epiphany yet. I, 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 I'm waiting on the Lord. I'm waiting on the Lord to tell me that. And so it was a process. Uh, it really was. It wasn't a straight line. There were things that were happening to me, changes in my life. Um, and downs, divorce, different things. Mm -hmm. And I began to really, really, really um, get closer and closer and closer and closer to the Lord Christ. And I want to tell you, it culminated one night um, in uh, Rockefeller Hall uh, at Harvard Divinity School. I was studying and I was reading a bitter cold night and couldn't go anywhere and I was listening to music and I was reading the Bible and, and, and I was really talking to God. What 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 do you have in store for my life? What's your plan? What do you what would you have me to do? Uh, and finally the Lord spoke to me as clear as I'm speaking to you now. I became overwhelmed uh, with the power of God's presence. Lord Jesus Christ spoke to me and stepped into my life and my heart and my head were converted uh, to, back to the Christian faith. And I had a clear 
insight into Christian theology, the importance of grace, what it means to say that we are saved not by works, but by faith, what it means uh, to say that the blood of Jesus Christ covers it all. My mother and my grandmother and my aunt used to always say, oh, I don't worry about you. You're washed in the blood. You're prayed up. And I never knew what that meant. It seemed like that night, all of this just came rushing forth, and it became the mystery. Uh, what what the big deal about Christian faith was? What the big deal about Christ's love was? What the big deal about grace was? That question that I never got answered as a child. I never uh, got anyone to electrify me with that knowledge. It seemed like that night. All of the stuff just became unpacked for me, became clear to me, and I, like almost like the Apostle Paul, was hit with a electricity in a boat. Uh, and boy, I became convicted and convinced um, that 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 the Lord indeed was calling me back to the church, back to the faith of my youth, back to the faith of my grandmother and my family. And uh, that night, I made up my mind, and I've been on that road wow. from that time uh, to this time. Powerful, powerful. You know, I, I want to ask you a question. Um, man, there's so much to chew on there. Um, so you, you had developed, like, this public life, you know, uh, in the nation of Islam, obviously, like you talked about, you know, being a minister, youth, I mean, you beat rappers, I mean, this national impact that you're having, um, you know, talk a little bit about the tug of war. You, you must, I would assume that you experienced, you know, having invested so much into the nation of Islam and then coming into Christ, Can, you know, describe that for our listeners a bit. What was that like? Uh, when I moved toward the nation of Islam, uh, uh, it was an exciting and thrilling exercise, learning more about black history and black culture. And I, I wish that I had grown up in a church that had a black studies program. Uh, I wish that uh, there's a company now out of Chicago uh, that has a, a, a Sunday school curriculum that's black oriented. Uh, I can't think of the name of the company right now, Jeff Wright and is, is uh, one of the executives there. He's a good friend of mine. But I wish there had been a, such a program. Um, it's important uh, that we, you know, teach our young people about the Christian faith in a historical and culturally relevant context. Uh, all I saw was a picture of a white Jesus. And so I could not, after a certain point, I could not relate to that. That was not relatable to me. And so while it was... Uh, it was easy for me to walk away from the church when I got uh, under the influence of people who had a very strong critique of some of these realities. Um, mm -hmm. But, 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 but I, you know, as you grow, you learn that there are challenges in all faiths and all religions. And fortunately um, I would meet later in life ministers who, uh, yes, were influenced by the nation. They saw the critique uh, that the nation made on the church, and then they, they, answered, uh, they answered that critique and rose to the occasion. And so for me personally, there was a struggle. There was a conflict. Um, and I thank God that I went to seminary because I got a chance to work through some of that. Um, when I first came back to the church, there were many programs that wanted me to come on. And I was offered jobs by some of the biggest preachers in this nation. Mm. But I said, no, 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 no. First of all, I am not coming to Christianity to be against anybody. I'm not coming to the Christian faith because of what, any, because of what anybody did to me. I'm coming to the returning to the Christian faith. I'm coming because the Lord converted my heart. I do not want to be a one trick pony. I am not interested in fulfilling anyone's uh, xenophobic 
and chauvinistic ideas uh, about someone who was in Islam and now they've come back to the church. Come on and tell us of what it was like during your time in darkness. Uh, that was not my interest. Mm -hmm. And so I dedicated myself to four years of theological study, earned two degrees, um, because I wanted to process. I wanted to be challenged. I wanted to uh, really, really go over some of these uh, important theological uh, concepts. Uh, and, you know, I left Harvard uh, after that conversion experience because there was a man by the name of James Hal Cohn. He was the father of black liberation theology. Mm -hmm. And I knew that as a black minister, uh, and I knew as someone who had preached in Harlem in the bowels of uh, the quote-unquote ghetto. Uh, I knew I was interested in urban ministry, and I knew that if I was going to really process where I had been and where I was going, uh, James Cone was the man to do it. He wrote a wonderful book called Martin and Malcolm, where he compared, contrasted, and and actually, in my view, conflated the ministries of Martin and Malcolm. And because I had come up in the church and I had gone down that road and was now coming back to the church, I didn't think there was a better person in the world that could be my teacher uh, and, and then Dr. Cohn. And I enjoyed my time studying with Dr. Cohn uh, at Union. And uh, so, you know, it, it, it is a struggle. I critiqued the church for 14 years and and, 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 and I am, will be very honest with you, all of those critiques are not invalid. I, I wrestle with those critiques as a pastor. As, just as there are Christians who convert to Islam, there are many Muslims that convert to the Christian faith. There are many black Christians that become Muslims and then ultimately come back to the church. And I think there needs to be someone uh, that can help people to uh, to understand that, that, that that's okay, that that journey uh, is a journey that, um, that, 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 you know, is, is all right. Now, I will tell you this, there are a large number of people who, after they leave the nation, uh, do not return to the church, and many of them don't go anywhere. They're disillusioned with religion. The church has been uh, critiqued in their eyes, and they don't see Christianity as a viable alternative. And that's part of my ministry to help people understand that Christianity is not the white man's religion. Uh, it is an it, it was founded in Asia by a Palestinian, uh, it's based on the life of a Palestinian rabbi. Okay, and uh, the first Christian nation was in Africa, and it went there from Asia, uh, and then it made its way to Europe. And so it's a global faith. Uh, it's a universal faith. And that's what uh, I want people to understand, because in many of our urban centers, uh, you know, there are a lot of black people that have been turned off from the Christian faith, and there are people who are so culturally uh, disciplined and rooted in black culture and rooted in an Afrocentric lifestyle, if we can't um, present Christianity in a palatable way to, uh, for them, they will never uh, 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 come back to the, to the church. So we've got to find new ways. And so my experiences, I think, are invaluable in helping me to understand the insight into people who, who, yes, they, they, they may be open to being Christians, but they don't want to be Christians in the, uh, in the sense where they have to negate their cultural and social consciousness. Well, let me ask you about that, as a matter of fact. I'm glad you said that, because, you know, in listening to your story, um, it seemed that, you know, you, you come into the nation from, like, this uh, socio-cultural pull, so to speak. You know, it really tugged on you in a deep level in that way. 
And then you know you go to seminary and then you come to Christ based upon a very personal and profound direct experience yeah. with God. Mm-hmm. You know, many times people um, in the church, uh, they know that God is real. They understand him in, 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 um, in a very deep way. But they have a hard mm-hmm. time taking that and then tapping into, you know, what it was that drew you to the nation of Islam is that that social cultural piece. As you as you mentioned a minute ago, thinking that Christianity is a white man's religion and so on. Like, what are some insights that you share with folks? Like maybe just one or two that help them to bridge the gap between knowing who Christ is and the grace that you've experienced and then allowing the gospel to translate into uh, and inform the social cultural concerns that they may have. We need to remember that Christianity was a movement, like the nation is a movement, uh, and like some of these other movements. Uh, the movement aspect of Christianity is lost upon many of our, 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 our church-going folk, because as long as they're in church on Sunday, they feel like they've done uh, what the Lord wanted them to do. But there is an evangelical aspect. Uh, there is an obligation. Jesus and his disciples out. He says, go into the highways, the byways, find the lame, find the halt, find the poor, find the disenfranchised. And and I think Christianity is most powerful. All religion is most powerful when we move beyond simply the priestly ritual to attempting to implement uh, at least the spirit of our faith. Uh, in the society. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, if there's anything uh, that I would love to maintain uh, from the nation and my ministry in the church is the enthusiasm, um, uh, is the the zeal to go out and share the message. And so, yeah, these are things that, these are just universal principles. Uh, that if you want anything to grow, if you want to share something and spread it, uh, you you've got to talk it up. You've got to you've got to share it, and that's that's exactly uh, what what the Lord did, and and what His disciples uh, did, and what what He challenged us to share the good news. Black church in particular is well, it's, it's overwhelmingly female, you know. While the Nation of Islam, you know, is as I understand it, is is mostly male. Uh, what is it that attracts black men to the nation of Islam and what can the church learn from it to attract black men, uh, black men to Christianity and reach out to them in the manner that you describe? Well, I think first of all, uh, programs and organizations and movements like King are very important. Uh, and that's why I want to celebrate the work that you all do. Um, Chris's commitment to black Christian men, it's very important that people like Dr. Johnny Ray Youngblood in Brooklyn, who I think has really done a lot of theoretical uh, study and, 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 and a lot of thought has gone into his very intentional uh, ministry to men. And there are others around the country that are doing that. And I think that's very important. We have to have a sea change in the church because when I was growing up in the church, Um, I saw the church largely as an affair for my grandmother, my mother, and my aunt. Uh, It was something that uh, I did not see the men in my community or in my family as concerned about. And even if they went, uh, I did not feel um, uh, that the church was really a place uh, uh, for men. And that's why when I first went to the, my, my first nation uh, uh, gathering um, and I saw the fathers, men in suits, and they had their sons with them in suits, and the unity of the males and the activity, the, the, the action and involvement of the males, it, was, it blew me away. It was, it was, it was, it was as, as different as night was from the day in terms of my experience with the churches. And so it's a very legitimate question. It's a very legitimate question. And I used to say to my women in the church that part of what we have to do 
in order to get more men involved in the churches that we have to make some fundamental changes. I say to the seniors, what are you willing to give up in order to get your children and grandchildren in church? And I say similarly to the women, what are you willing to give up in order to share some of the power, the influence? I think one of the biggest misnomers in the world is that black women are powerless in the church. I mean, that's a canard. That, mm-hmm. That's just fundamentally not true. <laughs> the the mm-hmm. churches are largely run by women, okay? <laughs> and so we have, to, we have to really look at these things because in order to get men involved, we have to uh, talk about males and leadership we have to talk about things in worship that appeal to men. And all of these things are legitimate uh, uh, concerns of missiology. Because, you know, if we are concerned about expanding the mission of Christ, the mission field, uh, you know, a lot of times we we'll go into the deepest, darkest jungles in South America and Central America to be engaged in, in mission. When we, if we would go right into some of these men's organizations and gyms and football fields and, mm. and fraternity meetings, we would find uh, just as naked a field, an untouched, untapped field of men that have not given their life to Christ. And so I don't have all the answers. Certainly, I've learned some wonderful things about dealing with men in the nation. Uh, but I will say this. I'm just happy when people are having that conversation because truly if the gospel is for uh, everyone, if it's to be shared with everyone who's uh, who's tired and, and everyone who's broken, uh, then, then we can't leave out men. And, and, and we have done that in the church uh, for far too long. And we've got to understand. That's why I love the King's emphasis and connection to sports, because sports has become the religion for many of our men as a substitute. Uh, One of the biggest challenges to getting black men in church on Sunday is because they're either washing their cars or watching the game or getting ready for the game. And so these are legitimate things that we have to talk about if we're going to ameliorate and turn around this, 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 uh, this situation that we have concerning men in the church. You, you brought up music. I'm, I'm a hip hop connoisseur, man. And um, you, you were known as the hip hop minister. So I have to ask you, I mean, in uh, making your assessment of the, the current state of hip hop and, and where it is now, do you think that it's too far gone? Is there anything that we can do to bring it back, you know, bring that positive change uh, about within uh, the hip hop community? Well, I hope so, you know, and, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, one of the things that Elijah Muhammad said, and it's very hard to argue with this, when the civil rights movement was making the thrust toward integration, uh, he warned us. He said, you know, my people have been through trauma. My people have suffered the indignities of slavery. He said, Let, he said I want to reform and clean my people up and get my people in a better shape. Uh, Many people argued with that, and certainly uh, I am glad that the civil rights movement was successful, and we were able to, under the leadership of people like Dr. King and so many others, break down the legal barriers to segregation. But one of the mistakes we made when we did that is that we abandoned our own community. I mean, let's face it, when the middle class uh, and the uh, educated classes uh, in segregation, everybody lived in the same community. So the welfare mother had a chance to interact with the teacher, with the doctor, with the lawyer, because there was a black community that had all of these elements, the preacher, social worker. We all live together. As a result of integration and greater opportunities, the leading class of blacks in many communities, in inner city Cleveland, inner city 
Philadelphia, in his city, Chicago, were able to move outside of the community, whereas in many African-American communities in the last 30 years, 30 to 40 years, in central cities, only the poorest, only the ones with least opportunity to have social mobility stayed in our community. And so you begin to get concentrated poverty. And with concentrated poverty come all kinds of pathologies. Mm -hmm. And when you start hearing in hip hop, different regions of the country uh, extol the values of the dysfunction uh, whether it's the dysfunction in New Orleans or the dysfunction in uh, South Central Los Angeles or Watts or the Bronx or whatever. And you begin to get young people, and this is one of the things I challenged the hip-hop movement back then because I understood this. A lot of preachers didn't understand it. Mm -hmm. In the old days, pathology and dysfunction was largely relegated to certain sections of the city. But when you put that on wax, mm. and when you give people record contracts to show all of the dysfunction in a certain section of New Orleans, and now these people are promoting this around the country, you have suburban youth now, middle-class youth, Christian youth carrying out these behaviors. Mm. And so the problems have been multiplied. We have a lot of things assaulting our community, whether it's an inordinate uh, reliance on popular culture, uh, the ideas of the marketplace, feminism, this, that, the other. Mm -hmm. All kinds of things are assaulting the traditional values and the traditional African-American approach for, uh, to life. And so hip hop is merely one of those challenges. And that's why we can ill afford to be smug and self-congratulating, sitting in our churches, feeling like we've actually done something because we had a worship service or Easter pageant or a bake sale when we have not said our job, if it's a senior woman in the community, in the, in the congregation, she can't be satisfied until she can share her life's lessons and knowledge with the younger women, not just in the church, but in the community. Same with the men. Mm -hmm. Same with us who are educated and who have something to offer our little brothers and sisters uh, that don't have the advantages that we've had. That's why you can't separate the gospel from that which is social. That's why the social gospel will always resonate with me. Uh, because if we if we if we can't find a way to apply this message of Christ, if we can't do what Jesus did, what did Jesus do? He started his ministry, and he came to preach a word. But when he encountered sick people, he didn't just give them a word. He healed them, right? right yeah. <laughs> and that was, that was the most important and impacting part of the word. Am I right or wrong? There you go. That's right. when, when, when people were hungry, he didn't just give them a word. He fed them. And that had a great impact upon their ability to receive the word. When people were without justice, when people were broken, he bound them up and he fought for them. And, and so we have, we have to do that. And I feel great uh, uh, being back in the church. I feel confident. That's why it was important that I came back to Harlem. I could have gone anywhere to, to minister. I could have gone uh, and hid somewhere and started life anew with essentially a new identity. But it was important to me that I came back to this community where I was once a, a strong advocate of the nation and also now share the good news message of Jesus Christ in the same community. Amen, amen. 
Well, you know, you've always led a, 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 a dynamic ministry, man. I mean, uh, both in the nation and obviously now as a Christian minister. Um, you know, wh- where d- what do you see yourself doing in the future? I mean, you know, what are your plans moving forward? Well, I want to I want to finish I want to finish this book because um, I have only scratched the surface in this conversation. The, the, the actual narrative is very fascinating, sure. and and people need to know. People need to know um, uh, and really. Uh, because every church I go to there, people say, I want you to talk to my son. He's, 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 uh, you know, either left the church or thinking about leaving the church. Talk to my daughter. And, and I just want people to understand my journey. It's a beautiful journey. I want people to understand that if their children go to another faith, it's not necessarily a cause for anxiety. Uh, keep loving them. You, you be the Christian that you're supposed to be. My my mother never rejected me. My parents never rejected me uh, when I left the church and went into the nation. They always, uh, as long as I was doing something positive, that was fine with them. But they said, uh, "You are all. We're not worried about you because you're already washed in the blood." And my grandmother knew that. And and so I'm saying that we as Christians have to stop worrying about other faiths. If we would be the people that Jesus made us to be, if we truly lived and displayed the good news to people, it has such a powerful and attractive appeal that the churches would never be empty. The the Christian faith would never, ever seem irrelevant. It would always be teeming with and overflowing with people if we stay on the message of Christ and get on the message of Christ and, and, and take that to this broken world. There's so many people that are inundated with bad news. All they want is some good news. Mm-hmm. And if we take it to them, we'll change their lives. We'll change this nation and we'll change this world. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Well, with that said, man, just, that's powerful stuff right there, man. I just want to say I well, appreciate you, you coming on the show. I thank you for oh, all I appreciate that you, that you, you shared with us. And, of course, for all the family out there listening, be sure to subscribe to the King Talks podcast on iTunes and SoundCloud. Give us five stars, leave a comment, and tell other people about what we're doing here. Also, if you want more information about the King Movement, be sure to stop by kingmovement.com and even join our online community at no commitment or cost to you. Until next time. Yeah. I brought the kings with me on this one. It's a movement. Yeah. I had a dream. I saw black slaves in 2017. Pulling the big king with a crown in the middle. Looking like tug of war. I guess they forgot the inheritance of the Lord. Dying over streets when God gave them the earth. It's all in the Bible. Just do your research. White man's religion, that's just fake news. The cross hit Africa for Europe, even new. This ain't black versus white, this is dark versus light. But racism might distract you from the Christ on sight.